Praise the Lord. Amen. Yes, you can. We're going to dismiss the children's church. Praise the Lord. We're going to go right over here, I suppose. We have, we have, we have a store. We have a child church. We have a child church. Child church. Child church. Yeah. Well, praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to share with uh, Cole today. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to, that you, you give us, Lord, to share your word with the uh, children that you entrust to our care. Father, we thank you for the anointing on the teacher. And we thank you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. As you see in your bulletin there, there is a scripture out of Isaiah in which he talks about putting on the garment of praise. The Lord says that he inhabits the praises of his people. That's what we're here to do today is to praise him and him alone. So let's stand and sing about that as we sing, put on the garment of praise.
to trust in Jesus. Amen. There's a song that we love to sing. It says, when you walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on my way, his, his way. Praise the Lord, my way. Praise the Lord. When we trust in the Lord, walk with the Lord, it is so sweet to trust in Jesus, is it not? Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's sing about that. Praise the Lord. Believe it. Praise the Lord.
And you laid a sermon on my heart as I was running. And so I want to start off with uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 through 8. It says, I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me in that day, and not a, to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. And so those are words of encouragement that we have. That pre and it really preaches to our soul and says, hey, you know what? It's gonna, it may be long. The travel, the journey may be, you know, take a lot of time, but it's worth it when we get to the end. Because the prize is great. And that prize is being able to live forever in the kingdom of the Lord with our Savior, Jesus Christ. So I kind of want to bring you through the journey that I went through to kind of come around to this. And actually, this is kind of a, a, a sermon for those that are ADD. Because there's a lot of different points in here. There are a lot of different points in here. So there should be something for everybody. So we'll go ahead and we'll start. And uh, that was my first few years. I was starting out. And really when I look at this, man, I was just like, thank you, Lord. What a gorgeous, beautiful day. What a one And that's the sunrise. That's not the sun sunset. That is the sunrise. And so I was up a little bit early and. And uh, out for a run, and, and that verse that says there, Jeremiah 30, uh, 32, 17. Ah, Lord God. That Lord, when it's in all caps, is Jehovah, the covenant God of Israel, who is now also our covenant God. The God that we are in, under contract with, that we, we are in covenant with. And it's a covenant that we can't break because we are kept by the power of God. Amen? Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Ah, oh, Lord God. And that word God in the Hebrew, as Jeremiah was saying, he was saying the word, he was saying the name Elohim, which means creator. Creator and judge. When you think about that, that sunrise and those beautiful mountains and those trees and those things that, that we see every day. You ever wake up in the morning around here, especially on a spring morning, the sunrise is just coming up and it's got all the beautiful colors in it. And maybe there's a low fog. It's, it's going to be a beautiful day. He tells them it's a beautiful day coming up. But there's just a little low fog in the back. It's just it's gorgeous out there. And you think, wow, my God does some really good work. He does some great work. He says, ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth. By thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing to Think about when we first got saved. Think about when we first committed our life to Christ. When we said, Lord, I'm now going to make you number one in my life. Isn't that how we felt right there? And it, it was like it was like our life was beginning anew, and it, and, it, and it was. And we see the beautiful blue skies, and we see the sun, the sun rise, and we see the clouds kind of parting off. And we think, wow, this is going to be great. This is going to be great. Our Christian journey is going to be marked with blessings. And so we, we start down that path. We start down that road. And then we go to, we go to where we, we have, like in our next slide, we have where it says, uh, let's see here, David. There we go. No, oh, no, that's no. before it advance. There we go. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, and thanksgiving, let your request be known unto God. And really, that's how our past starts out, doesn't it? It's all fresh, it's beautiful, we have flowers, we have those, those things in our lives and blessings that God is immediate. A lot of times we have that immediate healing in some of the areas of our life. We have some of those things that have tormented us for, for our entire lives and God suddenly just takes away. And it's like, whoo, praise God. He's relieved me. He's lifted that weight off my shoulders. And I'm just, man, we start down that path and all is good, isn't it? All is good. And then the next thing we come to is we come to what sometimes is a, is a challenge. And so we see a hill in front of us, the next one. And so I'm going to be honest with you. It doesn't look like a hill there. But right now, that's about... 
what was supposed to be a four mile run, that is probably about three and a half miles into a five and a half mile run. So about three and a half miles in, man, I've, I've, I've seen the beauty, man, I was so fresh, I was new, everything was great, everything was so, but as we go down that path, we start to get tired a little bit. Life starts to take its toll on us. And then we come up with challenges. Anybody face any challenges in their Christian life? Amen. Amen. And see, it doesn't look like that big of a hill from that view, does it? But I tell you what, this is what it really, really seems like. Seems like that. It seems like you're climbing that. And I'm telling you what, at three and a half miles in, that's what it felt like I was climbing, that little bitty hill. 1 Peter 4, 12 through 13 says, Beloved, think about strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to you is to try you. As though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice in so much as you are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. And see, that's that's the whole thing. It's the mindset. It's the mindset. We can look at that and we go, wow, that is unsurpassable. That is insurmountable. There is no way we can make it up that hill. Because see, in our mind, in the flesh, that's what we see. But we have to remember, go back one. Can you go back one? But that, in reality, is what it is. Doesn't seem like that much in comparison. But in our minds, we make it out to more because we're trying to do it in our own power instead of trying to do it in the power of God. You know, Christ tells us that all things are possible for Him. And they are. There is no mountain so high that God can't carry us over. There is no obstacle so great that he can't overcome it. Our God is an all-powerful God. A God is powerful enough to create the entire universe. A God is powerful enough to do, to give us life, to give us eternal life. He's powerful enough to overcome any temptation we have in our life, to overcome any sin that we have in our life, to overcome any obstacle that we have in our life. And we have to remember that just because it's an obstacle doesn't mean it's a bad thing. There are a lot of obstacles. There are a lot of challenges that are really good things for us. And God wouldn't allow them unless they were good things for us. When we encounter challenges, when we encounter obstacles, they're set there for a purpose. They're there for us to trust in God to show so He can demonstrate His power, so that He can build our faith, so that way we can live stronger and more victorious in Him. And what seems like an insurpassable mountain turns out to be just a little hill. And so when we finally get up to that, that little hill, all right, sometimes we kind of let pride take over. We think, wow, look what I did. And as I was running this, and trust me, it seemed a lot longer, like really that goes up for a ways. And the Lord brought my mind when I got to the top of that little knoll. Got to my mind because I was like, I was wanting to look back and just, I wanted to see from the top what it looked like down. I wanted to see like what I had actually done. And the Lord brought something to my memory. He brought the scripture about Lot and his wife. It says, Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plains. And all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. And I'm like, wow, Lord, that's kind of tough. I mean, you know, I was thinking, you know, because what the Lord brought to that, wait, the reason he brought that to my memory was because he was like, Abron, you didn't make it up this hill on your own. I carried you up this hill. I should you up this hill. You're up this hill because of the power that I've given you, not because of your own power. And to look back would be right. Because then you're looking back and going, what the, look what I did instead of praising God with, look what you did. And sometimes we do that. Sometimes we let pride take over in our lives, but there's other things that take over in our lives too. And when we look at 
Look at Lot's wife. And we think about Sodom and Gomorrah, and we know that from Genesis chapter 19. Many of us have, have, uh, have studied that in Sunday school. So there was great wickedness in Sodom and Gomorrah, and, and, um, and so God deemed that it should be destroyed. But he sent two angels in for Lot and his family because they were all the ones that were left that were righteous. It was just Lot. So they brought Lot, his wife, and his two daughters out. Now the angels gave specific instructions, do not look back. But see, Lot's wife missed that life that she had. She looked back and she missed what she was leaving behind. And she was turned into salt. So that means you can no longer move forward. And he got me to thinking about it. The Lord kind of impressed upon me as I was doing this run. He was like, now think about what kind of sins, and this is what we need to ask ourselves, what kind of sins do we have in our lives that turn us into salt? What kind of sins do we have in our lives that stop us dead in our tracks and keep us from moving forward because we're too busy looking back at what's behind us? What sin is in our life that we don't want to give up? And because we're not giving up that sin, it's keeping God from molding us and making us into the true treasure, into the true vessel that He has ordained us to be. You see, that's the lesson that I get out of Lot's wife, being turned into something. Is that it stopped her from moving forward. It was death to her. And that's what sin is. Sin is death to us. Praise God, Jesus Christ gives us life. And so all we have to do is we have to continue keeping forward, moving forward. We have to stop looking at the past. And some of that may be forgiveness issues with folks. Some of that may be other sins that we have in our past that we keep holding on to. It's like, okay, Lord, I'm giving you this, this, and this, and I and maybe I've tried to give you this sin. Lord, you haven't taken it from me yet, so I'm just going to wallow, wallow in it for a while. Well, that's not the way it's supposed to be. We're supposed to, we're, we're supposed to pick up our cross daily and follow Him. We're supposed to live our lives totally and fully committed to Him day in and day out. And so, even when we face those hills, we need to realize that when God has brought us through those hills, that even though he's given us victory over those things, yes, we can use those as a testimony, as a victory, but we don't need to be looking back either and, and wanting for that old life once he's given us victory. And interestingly enough, he's given us victory over everything in our life. He's just waiting on us to claim it. So we go through struggles in our lives. But we don't always go through the same struggles. Not every Christian walk is the same. In fact, there is no Christian walk that is exactly the same. Now, this is a view that I'm used to seeing quite a bit. And that's a person in front of me that just passed me going up that hill. Okay? Now, I'm used to that. Matter of fact, I did the double bridge run over in Pensacola when about 40 pounds ago. All right? About five years ago, 40 pounds ago. I did the double bridge run. And so... That was a rewarding yet humbling experience, especially as you have ladies passing strollers with kids in them, <laughs> passing you, okay? I had a 10-year-old kid pass me. Somehow that wasn't as bad. I was like, man, you got good. Look at you. He was running. Man. Just because somebody runs faster doesn't mean we shouldn't root for them. Just because somebody is, is maybe at that point in time because, you know, there's something with runners that's called pace. You keep pace, right? And so, in other words, some paces, not all paces are the same, though. And for runners, their pace changes. And what we mean by pace is that's the average number of miles or um, minutes it takes to run a mile. You have to get that right. Minutes it takes to run a mile. Now, mine can range anywhere from 17 minutes to a mile to 10 minutes per mile, depending on how you get a shape on but there's a, there's a sermon in there, too. Because how fast we run for the Lord depends on the shape that we're in. Depends on what we've been eating. Have we been filling ourselves with, with junk food from the world? Or have we been filling ourselves with a healthy diet of God's Word? 
And depending on what we've been ingesting will determine our spiritual health. And our spiritual health determines our pace and how strong we can run for God. That's a Holy Spirit thing. That wasn't part of the plan sermon. That was just what he gave right here. So somebody needed to hear that. Right. So there's a couple of things that come into mind. It says, For as the body is one and hath many members, all the members of that body, being many, are one body. So also is Christ. And so what we need to realize is, is we need to be okay. There's going to be people who, and there's different types of people with different paces. There are people who are sprinters. There are people who are cross-country runners. There are people who, you know, can run those intermediate distances. But they all, you know, they all kind of come together to form one track team. Remember the track team in high school? You needed all of them, didn't you? You needed short-distance runners. You needed long-distance runners. You needed folks that can have long legs like myself and can run the hurdles. Basically, I just kind of stepped over them. I didn't even have to jump when I was hurting Okay. And so, but we all have a purpose. We don't have to have all the same purpose. But we all have a purpose. And we need to be happy with the purpose that God has given us. Because I'll be honest with you. A lot of people look at, oh, well, the pastor's up here, the deacons are up here, and Sunday school teacher's up here, and the ministry of music is up here, and all such stuff. Let me tell you something. And those are the, the most important ministries of the church. most important ministry is the ministry that God has given each and every one of us individually. And God has a purpose for each and every one of us. And we have to see that purpose through. And so we can't let ourselves get caught up with ministry. In we have to accept the fact that hey, there's going to be some people who have beautiful voices. And then as much as I love to sing sometimes, God has... It, there was a time where I was able to do that. That time is no more. All right? He's given me a different mission to do that. But at the same time when I was singing, I wasn't called to preach either. Some people can do both. Praise God for them. There's, there's different types of folks for different ministries, but we all have to come together. We have to all realize that God has brought us together for a purpose. And guess what? When we're not here as a church collectively, and we're not all serving God together, it's the same thing as a human being trying to operate or trying to do something with a missing appendage. Yeah, if they get done, that's going to be a whole lot more difficult. You ever think about that? I, you know, people come and say, well, you know what? I can worship God in the woods, or I can worship God here, and I can worship God there. Well, yeah. And you know what? We should. We should be worshiping God 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. But there comes a time when we need to all gather together to glory His name. We need to come together to worship and to minister. And if we're not gathering together, if we're not part of the body, then the body is missing an appendage and it is, it becomes more challenging to perform the mission that God has ordained this church to perform. So that's why we all have to be present in order to do that. We all have to be consistent in doing that. Because any time that we're missing from this body, this body is missing an appendage, and it's making it harder for the church to do the mission that God has ordained. And we need to trust that God has given us the mission, and that it is the mission for us. You know, Jeremiah 1.5 says, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. And he was speaking to Jeremiah. But you know, he's done the same thing for each and every one of us. You know, I was once asked a question of my, of my ordination council. I like to call it the Spanish Inquisition, or actually the South Carolina Inquisition, because that's where it was at. And it was the largest one they had ever had. I don't know why. I guess <laughs> I guess I was that questionable. <laughs> but it was a large ordination council. There was probably about 15 preachers in that in that ordination council. It went for two and a half hours. Now I got passed with 100 percent vote. But here's the thing. One of those one of those individuals asked me. He goes, brother, what would you do? If this council didn't ordain you. You know what the answer was? I'm going to preach.
preach anyway. Because go. God is ordained. Amen. God has ordained each and every one of us for the specific ministry. That can be benevolence. It can be one of edification where you can <coughs> other people up and encourage people. It can be one of, of teaching. It can be one of preaching. It can be one of music. It can be one of recording. It can be administrative. It can be, there's, there's all kinds of things. It can be from cleaning the toilets in the church. That's a ministry. Trust me, I cleaned more toilets as a pastor than I ever did in the military. Why? Because it needed to get done. There's things that have to get done. And no matter what we're doing, as long as we're doing it for the glory of God, praise God. He is glorified as a result. And there is nothing that is more important than the other. But they all have to come together in order to succeed. But now are they members in one body. And we are. We're one body. So we need to be careful not to have ministry. And yeah, there's going to be people who, listen, their pace may be quicker than ours. They may be able to run. Man, there's some people out there. They run like gazelles on the Serengeti. Alright? And I used to, when I was in OTS, there was, a, there was this instructor and he used to tell us, you better run. You better run so fast. You better pretend like you're gazelle on the Serengeti and I'm a cheat and if I catch you I'm going to snap your spine that's what he used to tell us that's a good motivator to run fast by the way alright but listen there's people who can fly but there's other people like myself who have to run at my own speed and let me tell you something if I tried to run at somebody else's speed to keep up pace with somebody else I would tire out like that I couldn't run a mile the only way that I can run any distance of that's important is when I run at my own speed. And I have to listen to my body. Well, the thing of it is, is each and every one of us, we have our own speed that we're to run for God. And instead of listening to our body, we need to listen to the Holy Spirit. Because it's a spiritual race. And so, for some people, they can sprint. And then they rest, they recover, and they sprint again. They rest, they recover, they sprint again. There's folks like me. I'm like the tortoise. I'm slow and steady. All right? And that's okay, too. We have to be comfortable with the pace that God has given us. But we have to listen to God and let Him tell us what pace that is that we have to serve at. But make no mistake about it. We have to continue to move forward. We can't sit still. We have to continue to move forward because time is drawing nigh. And so there's going to be times where it's going to be tough. And we're going to see, and when I was looking at these mountains, I was coming into the finish of my run, and I was like, wow. You know what that mountain reminds me of? Clouded by, I mean, with those clouds, it was covering the top. And the mountain was there. The top of the mountain was there. But you couldn't see it because of all the clouds. And you know what? That's kind of how it is for us sometimes with God. It feels like we can't see Him. It feels like He's not near. And then they will cry out to the Lord, but He will not answer them. Instead, He will hide His face from them at that time because they have practiced evil deeds. And that's what we have to come to grips with. And sometimes in our life, we fall. Sometimes in our life, we sin. And we're faced with one or two choices. We can either confess our sins and repent and turn back and live that life for God, or we can continue to wallow in our sin. But when we continue to wallow in our sin, we affect our relationship with God. And sometimes when we have those hard challenges and those hills, those hills is to remind us of our sin, to recognize it, for us to recognize that sin so that we can realize it, so that we can repent about it, and we can confess it and repent and turn from that sin. And so I look at that, and it doesn't mean that God's not there. Just like the top of that mountain. The top of that mountain's there. It's just clouded, and you can't see it. And sin is the same way. Sin sometimes clouds us being able to see the mountain or to see God. God's still there, but there's a cloud of sin around us, and it limits our ability. So we need to recognize that. As we begin to recognize that, we'll start seeing evidence of God working in our lives. 
1 Corinthians 13, 12 says, For now we see through a glass dark, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And that's the thing we've got to remember, just like that mountain. Just like there was a cloud there. It didn't mean that mountain went there. That mountain was still there. <clears throat> When I looked at that, I'm like, you know what? There's times where we can see evidence of God in our lives. There's times where, man, we can see and even just the smallest evidence of God, His light shining through in our lives, is awe-inspiring and breathtaking. It's beautiful. But it's still not the full glory we're going to see whenever we get to heaven. It says, no longer will I have... The sun for light by day, or the brightness will the moon give you by light. But you will have the Lord for an everlasting light, and your God for your glory. Your sun will no longer set, nor will your moon wane, for you will have the Lord for an everlasting light, and the days of your mourning will be over. Then all your people will be righteous. They will possess the land forever. The branch of my pain, the work of my hands, thought I may be the Lord, that I may be the Lord. And I praise God because you know what? <clears throat> this life, this race, does have a finish line. But the end of that finish line becomes a great rest and a great peace. And a peace in which we will be able to see the full glory of God. Isn't that going to be awesome when that day comes? When I look at that, I see the glory of God. And I look at the clarity. Because there are times in our lives where we, it's like that previous picture. We can see His presence. We can see, you know, a shadow of His glory. But there's going to come a day. There's going to come a day when we see His glory in full. When we see Him in person. When we see Him face to face. And praise God, we'll have a spirit and a body that will be able to handle. That will be able to take in the presence and drink in the presence of His full glory. And then that day we'll finally get the rest. And that's me at the end of that run, by the way. I asked Debbie to, and by the way, we were on the third floor. I had to take the elevator up because I wasn't doing stairs. I said, I asked Debbie to come out and take that picture, and she looked at me like I had a third eye. I said, Trust me, there's a purpose for it. It says, Know ye not that that which run in a race run all? But one receiveth the prize. So run that you may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it, obtain a corruptible crown. But we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainty, so fight, not as one that beateth in the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that he by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. And so the thing of it is, is we need to remember that it's not about us. It's all about God. And we run that race not for our own glory, not for our own honor. We run this race for Him. We, we need to be giving it our all. Whether we're giving it our all, we're running a sprint and then rest a little bit and then sprint. Or we're doing a marathon. Or however God has called us to run our race, we need to be running it all for Him. We need to do doing it for His glory and not for ours. And we need to remember that there are going to be a great amount of prizes that's going to be thrust upon us in heaven. But praise God, those prizes are going to be so that we can thrust them at the throne at Jesus' feet and say, Glory, hallelujah, thank you, Son of God. Thank you for giving me life. Thank you for allowing me to experience the glory of heaven. Thank you for healing my body. Thank you for healing my spirit. Thank you, God. Because you've now given me love and life and peace and joy. More than I've ever been able to experience. And I praise you, God, for it. And I don't want to be sitting there in that day. But I sure I will be. Wishing I had more to throw at his feet. Don't you want to know that you've done everything, that you've done all that you can to cast all that you can at Jesus' feet? 
It's important that we run our race and we run it well. In order to run our race well, we have to be consistent in how we run our race. We have to be, we have to feed ourselves and have a healthy diet, which is the Holy Spirit giving us that, that word of God. We have to feed ourselves the word of God. Through reading the Bible, allow the Holy Spirit to talk to us. Not just a verse a day keeps the devil away. Not just reading a chapter to say, or a book or the Bible saying, hey, look, I've read the Bible all the way through in a year. Hey, that's great. But I tell you what's greater is reading for purpose. Reading for joy. Reading for understanding. Reading for wisdom. Reading and then being still and allowing God to speak. That's when we get the most out of life. It's when we stop thinking. We read the word of God and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to our souls. And in that day, we'll truly, truly be able to say, Oh, Lord God, Oh, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by the great power stretched out thy arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. Mm -hmm. Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the time you've given us to be here together. Lord, we pray that there's someone here today who feels like they need to rededicate their life, Lord, that maybe they, they've sidetracked on their path they've stumbled in the run. But they want to get up and they want to run again for you. They want to be consistent in their living for you. Lord, I pray that today will be the day of their rededication. Lord, if by some chance there's someone here today who has never committed their life to Jesus Christ. Lord, we know it's one thing to know who you are, to acknowledge that you are God, and to acknowledge that we have sinned. But it's something totally different to make your son, Jesus Christ, Lord, Savior, Master, number one in our life. Or if there's someone here today who has not made your son, Jesus Christ, number one in their life, they have not committed to the sin of prayer to commit themselves to you, have not seen a change in their lives, Lord, we pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you would touch their souls, you would awaken them, to let them know where they truly stand, and Lord, the consequences of that stand. Lord, let them also know that today can be the day of their salvation. Lord, that all they have to do is they walk down this aisle, we can pray a prayer together, Lord. And as long as in their heart they're willing to commit to you, today they may be saved. Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit will touch each and every person that is in that situation. Let them know that today they can be saved. They can have eternal life. They can feel more joy, more peace, more love. Or there may be others that just need to come down and pray. Either for themselves or for others in their lives, Lord. Let them know that the altar is open for them now. But whatever it be, this invitation we dedicate to you. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. You would please stand as we sing hymn number 343. Amazing.